thank you uh, for inviting me uh, here. It really is a great, uh, great honor. Uh, Mike Howe, thank you for uh, allowing me to come. And uh, what I uh, am going to talk about today is the future of wood and biofiber. Uh, how wood as a uh, biomaterial, sustainable biomaterial, contributes to a sustainable world. And actually the title is somewhat misleading in that I'll talk about a lot of things. Uh, some about the use of wood uh, in the past, uh, or the development of wood in the past, uh, all the way through to uh, maybe some applications uh, in the future. And uh, I focused more on a global view than an African view because um, I'm not an expert from Africa. Uh, some of you are, and uh, so I hope uh, to be educated as we go through the, uh, the rest of the meetings. Uh, I have many collaborators on uh, uh, this uh, talk, uh, most for some of the personal research that I'll present uh, at the end, but they include uh, colleagues at my former institute, the University of Maine. Uh, they also include colleagues from Georg August University in Göttingen, Germany. Uh, and also colleagues at Virginia Tech. And the images that you see up here really represent uh, some of the images that you'll see at the end of uh, the talk uh, related to wood anatomy and bordered pits in softwoods, but uh, also on new ways to make composites or maybe some new ways to think about wood and wood fiber and how we use it. So the focus of this talk is uh, why is wood such an interesting material? Uh, how did it first form? I also wanted to cover some of the unique ways that we use wood and uh, also uh, use it to uh, do things like sequester carbon uh, and uh, reduce our uh, reliance on petroleum-based products. Uh, we can do more with wood than we are doing now. Uh, we want to look at some of the lignocellulose chemistries in the nanostructure of wood and determine how we can make new products using or better understanding some of these properties. And we're still learning things about wood, of course, uh, and I'll review that with some of the summaries of my personal current research on this bordered pit ultrastructure and uh, how wood was used to create the legendary Damascus steel. Now, for some of you that uh, know me, you know I'm in the Department of Sustainable Biomaterials uh, at Virginia Tech. That used to be, up till a year ago, the Wood Science and Forest Products Department. Uh, under my uh, directorship of the program, we changed the name. And we changed it for a reason, and that is because uh, our student numbers were dropping. And we couldn't find students that were interested in wood are not ones that wanted to make a career of it to, to study. So we changed the name to Sustainable Biomaterials, and we've gone from 25 students up to 85 students. We still teach about wood science, and that is the majority of what we teach, wood science and forest products, but we have a different name which gets them in the door. So we, uh, another thing that I talk about frequently is changes in educational curricula in the United States in wood science and forest products programs. And uh, I'll be happy to talk with people about that. Uh, I've given SWST uh, Society of Wood Science and Technology talks on that in the past. And I'll also be happy to talk about uh, this, uh, but I'm not going to talk about it today. This is a paper from Science from a year ago on uh, fungal degradation of wood. And this is an area that I have lots of collaborators around the world uh, in and uh, would like more, uh, so even some uh, perhaps from Africa. So if you have any interest in uh, uh, this area, feel free to come and talk with me about it. All right, um, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the history, so to speak, uh, of wood. Uh, where does it come from or what does it do? Uh, well, uh, there is a clear relationship between climate change, greenhouse gas production, and the use and biodegradation of wood materials. It's important uh, that we utilize this material over here, but use it in the context uh, of the global environment, because what we need to avoid is this sort of a situation where we are taking wood and essentially put it in the dump uh, just to have it uh, uh, evaporate into CO2. It does no use and it doesn't sequester carbon. 
Uh, so we can perhaps find better ways to, uh, to work with wood. Uh, if we look at geological time, uh, when did woody plants begin to form? Well, about 400 million years ago, and plants at that time figured it out. And they began, they'd been producing cellulose for many millions of years, but at that time they began to figure out how to make lignin. And once cellulose and lignin combined, that is when we started to make wood, and that allowed uh, trees to develop to make the wood and grow a much taller. Okay? Interestingly, though, with the large amounts of biomass that could be produced when you combined cellulose and lignin, uh, that pulled a lot of carbon out of the air, and that drove down carbon dioxide levels in the environment. And people have been trying to understand why that happened for many years. And there's an excellent paper in the journal Science that came out uh, principally by a couple of colleagues, uh, David Hibbett and Dan Eastman, uh, also colleagues on that previous paper in Science. Um, and they just figured out that it took fungi over 100 million years to figure out how to de decay lignin. So this is why wood did not decay for about 200 million years. And if you take a look at these graphics here, what happened was you start off about 400 million years ago. If I can get the pointer to work. And sorry, usually I like to walk around, but I think we're, we're and, and wave my hands more, but uh, uh, I'm kind of tethered to this micro microphone here. Um, okay. Um, what you see here is that in the mid to late Devonian period, uh, we got carbon fixed in the form of wood, lignin, and cellulose, and the CO2 levels dropped precipitously till uh, the end of the Carboniferous period. And at that point, as it turns out, the fungi learned how to degrade lignin. So all this woody biomass essentially piled up in the forest. Trees grew and grew and grew, producing what we now know as wood or a precursor to wood. And it collected, ultimately getting buried under more and more biomass because it simply could not decay. What happened then? Well, a lot of it turned into coal. And once buried, uh, it does slowly carbonize and forms deep seams as, of that coal. And that coal stayed buried, inert, for about 300 million years until the Industrial Revolution hit and we started digging it up and burning more and more of it. And that released CO2 in the atmosphere uh, in ways that uh, the fungi never were able to do. So we lost our balance. And I'm sure you have seen graphics uh, like this before. These have been borrowed from other groups. Uh, but we now have the greenhouse effect, uh, and as CO2 levels rise, and bear in mind, they're not nearly, they're, they're only one-tenth what they were back in the Carboniferous period, okay? Uh, but, uh, or 400 million years ago, rather. And, but they are increasing slightly, and that is enough to upset the balance uh, in global temperatures uh, that we are seeing now. So we need to do something about this. How can we help? Well, one way is to use more wood and use it in sustainable and creative ways so that we can sequester more carbon. And if we uh, do carvings and use wood like we are doing today uh, outside of uh, this lecture hall, that is one excellent way to do that. Um, wood has been used for centuries to create objects of warmth and beauty, and it's important that we continue these traditional uses, because if we do create objects of warmth and beauty, these will be carried on from generation to generation. And essentially, that is one way to sequester carbon. And uh, my work here doesn't compare to some of the other pieces, but I figured I would throw it in so you don't think that I'm just a biochemist or a wood composites guy and can make a few things as well. All right, humans have also go, but gone beyond uh, the ability to make useful uh, uh, materials uh, from furniture and can also make things that are considerably larger out of wood. And we have done this uh, for centuries and we've learned how to make wood 
strong and durable. And we can also now design in very unique ways to use wood and use more wood in creative ways that, that has functional purposes. And wood is an amazing uh, sustainable material. Um, we are really, ju though, just starting to see uh, the tip of the iceberg, or we have seen just the tip of the iceberg relative to what we're able to do with wood. So I was hoping to show you some of the traditional things that we use it for and what we're moving into. Uh, we can use wood for an energy source and we have for uh, many, many uh, millennia. Uh, we're now using it in different ways, pelletizing it, uh, even taking wood and turning it into a, uh, a fuel that is liquid in nature uh, so that we can use it uh, in, as a transportation fuel. Uh, we already use wood in many different varieties, uh, not just alone, but in advanced hybrid composites. And one of the unique ways that we can use wood, uh, and one that clearly uh, would be considered by many to be an advanced technology, is uh, the use of wood as the floor in the Corvette sports car. It's also used uh, in uh, some jet aircraft uh, because it has very unique properties. Uh, the Corvette sports car has had a wooden floor, or a wood composite floor, for about 14 years now. And they went with the wooden floor because they had tried many other materials, steel, fiberglass alone, carbon. None of them worked as far as the noise level in the coupe. It was always a very noisy car. So they went to a wood floor and it turned the coupe into a quiet, vibration-free machine. So um, wood has amazing uses that we are already seeing. Uh, but there are also many near-term future uses that we can consider. Green chemistries, nanomaterials from cellulose and lignin, and unique materials from carbon that we can make from wood. We have used it now for things like producing bioplastics to flexible carbon nanostructures and uh, for oral drug delivery systems. Uh, these are not systems that are in place yet but they are coming. As it turns out, cellulose is a very good material for making drugs, such as those that you have uh, maybe in your medicine cabinet at home, uh, more soluble in the body. The biofeedstocks to replace petroleum-derived polymers in plastics is an area that's coming. You can take wood, uh, you can extract the lignin from it, which is a common process, a standard soil bacteria which can convert lignin through bioprocessing and turn it into a variety of different bioplastics, including some that stretch just like spandex. So if we can do that with wood rather than petroleum-based products, that would be so much better for sustainability. This is uh, some chemistry here. We don't need to go through the chemistry, but uh, I thought I would put it up. It's some excellent work by colleagues in Japan, uh, Otsuka and Nakamura-san from the FFPRI in Japan. In this molecule here, they call it PDC. It's a perone with two uh, dicarboxylic acids. Uh, is very functional and can be used to make polyamides, polyurethanes, and polyesters. And polyesters is really something that many, many companies are looking for now. And if we can make a polyester from wood, that would be a fantastic thing. This is something that they have done in the Japanese lab uh, just as far as making a glue, an adhesive, out of this PDC from the lignin. And it's quite a strong and impressive glue. We are working with natural nanomaterials uh, to make a variety of uh, materials, or products rather. And on the right, you can see cellulose triacetate films. This product is already in commercial production and it allows the television screens, LCD screens on computers and that sort of thing to be seen much more clearly than uh, screens, LCD screens that were produced even five or six years ago. Uh, cellulose nanocrystals, 
There in North America, there are now three factories, if you will, uh, that are set up to produce cellulose nanocrystals. So this is technology that is, is here. One of, those, uh, one of those production facilities is in Canada. Two are in the United States. And uh, the next generation of uh, um, ballistic transparent windshields, for example, may come from the, the use of cellulose nanocrystals. Uh, the National Science Foundation predicts that these cellulose nanocrystals uh, will be uh, a $600 billion industry by the year 2020. So not too far in the future, and we are already producing these on a commercial basis right now, from wood. These are woody materials. What else can we do with nanomaterials? This is, uh, these are spun, wet spun, and what is called electro spun uh, cellulose materials. Essentially, we've taken wood pulp and turned it into a, a nanomaterial. We can use these for medical applications. This is electrospun cellulose fiber, and it has been coated by a chemical called hydroxyapatite, which is commonly used in some medical fields. Uh, in this particular case, the electrospun cellulose has been turned into a scaffold. That scaffold can be inserted as a bone graft, uh, essentially a template for growing bone cells or osteoplasts. And that is being done now in mice. The cellulose material is wonderfully compatible and it also uh, is reabsorbed into the body uh, after three or four years. So the technology that we currently use if you break a bone is to take a titanium plate and screw it in place. Well, in the future, we hope that you can use cellulose from trees and turn it into a scaffold which you will just have to insert once but not have to go in for a second surgery to take that titanium plate out. Instead, it will dissolve like the cellulose coated with hydroxyapatite will. Now, um, we're also using wood. This is uh, carbonized cellulose here. Uh, wet spun carbon nanocellulose fibers. Uh, you can do that quite easily. The technology is quite simple, really. You simply dissolve up the, the cellulosic material and extrude it out through a needle, a syringe, into an acetone bath. And you come up with cellulose that is spun, and you can carbonize that. And then you can weave that carbon into a variety of different types of uh, um, electromotive force shields, uh, uh, internally heated fabrics, uh, static resistant fabrics, that sort of thing for the future. Some of my work is uh, shown here. We can take uh, woody materials and we can carbonize those in certain ways. And as it turns out, carbons from wood are excellent for energy storage because they have very high surface area depending on how you heat those materials. So if you can heat them in a certain way, you can produce a carbon with lots and lots of surface area. So we have taken wood down, excuse me, yeah, too complex. We've taken wood down here in the lower right corner and we have put it in a supercapacitor uh, blank, essentially a mold and we've just taken wood fiber and put it into that mold and then we have carbonized that. That's what the other two images are. And uh, the people that make the supercapacitors have said that the properties are better than anything that they see from a rare earth material. Okay, can we learn even more about wood through research? Well, we believe so. Uh, it should certainly be possible because as I said before, we're really just seeing the tip of the iceberg right now in how we use wood. There are lots of other amazing ways that we can, uh, are things that we can do with wood. And combining wood with other materials will lead to new advances. So if we look not just as wood as an isolated material, but how we combine it with other uh, advanced materials, I think will be a critical issue. So I'm gonna show a couple of examples from my research group. Uh, this first one is not on how to combine, but just really on the basic anatomy 
of wood, particularly softwoods. And this was done with uh, particularly Danila Maschek uh, from uh, Germany. And Danila was a student that was with me. Sorry, I'm not used to this pointer here. I'd, I'd rather go up and just point to it on the screen, but you have two of them. And I can't stretch that far. So <laughs> okay. Um, so this is Danila and her work. Uh, the 4 pi microscope, I won't go into the details of it, but when we started this work about four years ago, there were only three of them in the world. So it allowed us to see a little bit about uh, uh, the structure that had not been seen before. Uh, this is not our work here. Well, actually it is. Uh, uh, those images are our work, but just taken with regular light microscopy. And what are bordered pits? Uh, for those of you that work with wood at the macro scale, uh, wood is quite beautiful, as Peter indicated earlier, uh, at the microscopic level. And uh, essentially bordered pits are little check valves. And if we look at this bordered pit right here in cross section, this is one cell here, this is another cell over here, and it allows fluid to flow from one cell to the other, at least if the pit is in its normal state. But once the pit becomes aspirated, uh, it will pull over to one side and block the flow of fluids from one cell to another. These are not my images either. These are from Cor, Cote, and Day many, many years ago. And uh, the ultrastructure of wood, just like the macrostructure of wood when carved into uh, beautiful things, the ultrastructure is quite beautiful on, on its own. So amazing things. Uh, from wood, uh, even at levels that we normally don't get to look at. What happens in the aspiration process is what I'm showing right here, in that that bordered pit membrane moves from one side, the central area rather, to one side to essentially seal off that bordered pit. And that has been known for many, many years. Uh, why did we want to study bordered pits further? Well, uh, because they're unique and fascinating uh, microstructures in wood. They control liquid flow, and they also provide a barrier to microorganism penetration. Uh, we also feel that if we understand how they work better, we'll be able to work with wood preservative technologies and impregnation and even wood drying more efficiently. So this is a little bit of a video that I put together. Uh, on the upper right, you can see the key. Anything that is red is pectin, one of the chemicals in a bordered pit. And we've known that pectin has existed in bordered pits for many years, but we haven't known exactly where it is. We also have uh, things, the green in this image is uh, crystalline cellulose, and we'll play it for you here. One of the things you're going to see, which may be a little hard once we get things going, is that we have an outer ring here of pectin, and then in the aspirated pit, we have an inner ring of pectin, which is separated from a central region. And in the unaspirated pit, that pectin essentially forms one large mass. In the aspirated pit, it pulls away to uh, block the pit aperture. So we'll see. Okay, let's see if it works this time. There we go. So you can see the outer ring, uh, which tends to function, this outer red ring, tends to function as a, a bit of a shock absorber for the, uh, the more crystalline strands of uh, the margot. And what I'm not showing you here is how that central region of the uh, torus, the pectin pulls away from the outer part, outer part of the torus and collects in the pit aperture. But that is what this is showing. Another image here shows the nature of uh, the double layer of the torus in a softwood, in this case, uh, eastern white pine. And some things we had not realized before is that the uh, torus, uh, because it has a double layer, actually is uh, hollow or has a neutral material in the interior. And we'll show you that with this video here. And I hope uh, 
when we uh, get through optically sectioning it with the 4 pi microscope and roll it over here. If you look quickly now, you can just see a little bit of light coming through there. That is the central hollow zone of the torus, uh, which had not been seen before. So we were, uh, uh, we were quite surprised to see that. Okay, so the conclusions from this uh, are that we can learn still some interesting things about wood uh, at the ultrastructure level, and they may help us in processing of wood in the future. Now we move on, and this is the last bit that I will cover, and I talked before about not looking at wood in isolation. It's important sometimes if we are working with uh, uh, things of warmth and beauty, uh, the, uh, the carvings, for example, outside under the tent, uh, but can we do other things with wood and have these other things been done in the past? Well, uh, in fact, um, we know that wood was used to make one of the most, most amazing steels that have ever been produced. But the secret for making that steel was lost about 300 years ago. In the Middle Ages, Damascus steel swords were very famous. Uh, these were used by the Islamic peoples, and uh, they, there are stories from the Europeans who were fighting battles uh, with uh, the Islamic peoples at that time of how sharp these swords were, how ductile the blades was. You could bend them almost double, and they would still spring back with uh, no permanent deflection. Uh, the blades were extremely sharp and very strong. Uh, stories about cleaving through a European helmet made out of bronze and then being able to take a silk handkerchief and floating it over the edge of the blade and it would just separate the, uh, uh, the handkerchief. So amazing properties of this, but no one has really known why it formed. Now, concurrently, uh, we were interested in wood in my group and we had heard sporadic reports of carbon nanotubes being formed in campfires and in places where lightning strikes had occurred. So that resulted in charring of wood in the production of carbon nanotubes. We decided we would look at carbonized wood and carbonizing it in a specific cyclic manner using specific temperatures. And indeed, when you used specific temperatures, and not cellulose and not using lignin, but using the combined cellulose lignin in the specific way that wood puts it together in the wood cell wall. We were able to get carbon nanotubes produced. Why are we interested in these? Because the tensile strength properties, for example, are about 30 times stronger than steel. If you can make something out of wood that is 30 times stronger than steel, then you really have something. So this is how wood or the cellulose structure is put together in wood. This is an image from Jeff Daniel, uh, my colleague from Sweden. And essentially the lignin has been removed here by a white rot fungus. What happens if those cellulose microfibrils in an intact cell wall were pre-carbonized and turned into carbon nanotubes through what we call select ablation? Well, I've got an image right here of what happens and how we do that. We carbonize the wood. What happens is lignin surrounds cellulose. The cellulose microfibril, uh, once the carbonization process occurs, turns into carbon vapor. That carbon vapor is trapped within the lignin, so it has no place to go. And so it reforms into a carbon nanotube. And that carbon nanotube then can be used for a variety of purposes. And one of the purposes, particularly because they come out in an aligned form, just as you would see the cellulose nanostructure of wood in an aligned form, uh, we may be able to take these and use these in certain types of composites. And just to uh, orient you, alignment and dispersal of carbon nanotubes is something that no one has been able to do very well in any type of material. So it's kind of a, uh, a holy grail, if you will, for what material scientists are trying to figure it out. Well, wood already does that already. So if we can use the properties of wood to align and disperse these 
and take them and take wood and put it into steel. We're not interested in making swords, but lots of people are interested in making lighter weight vehicles that are interested in making uh, oh, turbine steel for nuclear reactors, uh, engine parts that are stronger and more durable, for example. Then we have a unique way to, uh, to make this using wood. And we shouldn't think of it as steel. We should think about it as a steel wood biofiber complex. So we haven't done this yet. We've only produced the carbon nanotubes. Getting it into the steel is what we're working on right now. In fact, I hope my students are doing it right now in the lab. Okay, wood is not just a good material. It's an amazing material with lots of good things to come from it yet. We've just seen the tip of the iceberg. And with that, I will finish off and thank you for your time. <laughs>